to the ACAP virtual forum, healthcare disparities through the lens of dis diversity during the COVID-19 pandemic. If we could change the slide, please. One more. I'm Cheryl Almatine, and I'm one of your co-chairs for this afternoon's session. Um, we have three slides here of uh, disclosures. Um, you can see them here. Thank you. Here's our agenda for the afternoon. We will begin with an address from our president, Dr. Gabrielle Carlson. Hi, um, my name is Angel Caraballo and I am the uh, co-chair of this forum. And I'd like to introduce um, our president, my mentor, my friend, Dr. Gabrielle Carlson. Thank you. Thank you, Angel and Cheryl. And thank you, audience, for joining us today for this really important and timely forum. I'm so proud of the Academy and our member-driven initiative that put this together. It was formulated, I want you to know, when we were merely addressing the COVID-19 uh, healthcare disparities. Now we're dealing with this endemic. This endemic, for those of you who haven't heard the word before, we can have this endemic slide, um, involves the mutual reinforcing interaction of diseases. In this case, the novel coronavirus and age old systemic racism. And the interaction is with social conditions. The social conditions, of course, include, among other things, lack of adequate pay, lack of adequate childcare, lack of adequate public education, lack of adequate housing, lack of respect for people of color, and of course, lack of adequate health care and mental health care. So I'm here to listen. I have limited personal experience with feeling unsafe around people who are supposed to keep us safe. I have a little experience with gender bias <laughs> and increasingly with age bias, but nothing like what people of color experience. So I'm here to listen and learn. One thing I can say with a bit of pride is that I've been the teacher of someone who is now in the position to teach me on health. So we at the Academy are looking to our experts on diversity and culture to provide that guidance and education. We're here to listen, to learn, and to act. So let me turn it back to Dr. Carabayo. Thank you, Dr. Carlson. Um, we'd now like to give you a little bit of an introduction um, to our forum today. We'd like to um, begin by telling you about the case of Jamal. We ask you to please um, keep this case in mind as we go through um, all the different presentations um, this afternoon. So Jamal, slide please. Is an 11 year old in the sixth grade. Jamal really likes school. He lives in the South Bronx in New York. He's told that he will be staying home from school for the foreseeable future because of the pandemic. He doesn't really understand what it is. His mother is a nurse's aide in a hospital. She has only had this job for three months and does not have health insurance. She decides Jamal will stay with his grandmother who lives in the same apartment complex. Grandmother has a television and a smartphone but, but low speed internet. He has an iPad from school. Three weeks later, due to lack of PPE at work, mother becomes ill with presumed COVID-19 and has to stay at home in isolation. She was told that she does not meet criteria for testing. She cannot visit Jamal and her mother, and she won't let Jamal visit her either because of fear of infecting him and his grandmother, who also has increased risk due to the di diabetes and asthma. Jamal is the only one who can go and get groceries at the bodega, grocery store. He does not have a mask. He carries cash and he's scared that someone will rob him. He worries about his mom, who's very tired all the time and he's not eating well. He checks, she checks in on her a couple of times a day on his smartphone so that he can see her. He helps his grandmother in the apartment and does even more chores than he's used to doing. He helps grandma with cooking, with cooking and then takes food to his mom knocking on the door and leaving it for her. Grandmom is also feeling very tired 
and he's worried about her too. He begins having nightmares and feels really sad. He's having trouble completing the schoolwork. He gets tired because the internet is so slow. He's also having difficulty concentrating on his games. So just a little bit of history. In 2001, David Satcher, who was our first African-American Surgeon General of the United States, published a supplement to his previous publication, which was Mental Health, a report of the Surgeon General. This one was entitled Mental Health, Culture, Race, and Ethnicity. And here he talked about disparities in mental health um, uh, um, prevalence and treatment in groups of color, all of which we will be talking about today. The conclusion to this report was that racial and ethnic minorities bear a greater burden from unmet mental health needs and therefore suffer a greater loss to their overall health and productivity than members of other groups. We have the next slide, please. In one more click. In 2002, the Institute of Medicine shared that there were disparities across all areas of medicine, and of medical care. They indicated that what we need to do to help manage these disparities is to utilize evidence-based guidelines, produce more minority healthcare providers because this group of providers is more likely to take care of minority patients, that we need to make more interpreters available in clinics and hospitals, and to increase awareness about disparities among the general public, healthcare providers, insurance companies, and policymakers. They recommended that we have cross-cultural education as well. Next slide, please. As we put together uh, all of the presentations that you're going to hear during this, um, during this virtual uh, town hall, we realized that there were some core terms that were necessary for everyone to understand. So we'll just review them very quickly here and they'll be reinforced throughout the next two hours. A health inequality or difference it's just the existence of a difference in health status or the distribution of health determinants between different population groups. A health disparity, on the other hand, is a particular health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, or environmental disadvantage. These health disparities adversely affect groups that have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on race or ethnic group, religion, socioeconomic status, gender, age, mental health, cognitive, sensory, or physical disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, geographic location, or other characteristics that are historically linked to discrimination or exclusion. Next slide, please. A healthcare disparity relates to differences, I'm sorry, a healthcare disparity relates to differences in the quality of healthcare that are not due to access clinical need, patient preferences, or appropriate, appropriateness of the intervention. This has to do with what we do as providers and what the organizations and systems that we serve in do related to that. These include the roles of bias, discrimination, and stereotyping at both the individual, at the institutional, and health system levels. Health equity is making sure that we attain the highest level of health for all, all people. And it requires everyone valuing being, everyone being valued equally with focused and ongoing societal efforts to address avoidable inequalities, historical and contemporary injustices, as well as the elimination of health and healthcare disparities. One more definition. Social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, and the systems that are put in place to deal with illness. These circumstances are shaped by distribution of power, money, resources at local, national, and global levels. The social determinants of health are mostly responsible for the health inequities that we have, the unfair and avoidable differences in health status that are seen within and between countries. And that's the definition from the World Health Organization. This is a visual representation of the terms equality and equity. Here we see that in an equality situation, everybody is given the same amount of help, but doesn't get them to where they need. We also see an equity situation on the right, 
we're differing amounts of help to those who need them provides, gets everyone to the place where they need to be. Thank you, Cheryl. So how are we going to put all these terms together and relate them to the COVID-19 pandemic? I ask you to please think again about Jamal. Um, and we will relate this graphic um, of the description of social determinants of mental health and health in general to the case of Jamal. First, let's look at what we know about Jamal and his um, distribution of opportunity as he pertains to him. In terms of the unfair distribution of opportunity that Jamal has faced, we know that he only has one parent, which tells us about his um, adverse early life event experiences. Um, he lives in the South Bronx. The, for those of you who are familiar with the South, South, Bronx, South Bronx, know which kind of a neighborhood it is. And for those, it's an impoverished area in, with high in which high degree of homelessness, food and transportation insecurity and exposure to violence occurs. His mother has no access to healthcare, which probably suggests that neither does Jamal. Jamal attends public school in the Bronx where um, the education provided is typically suboptimal. What we don't know about Jamal, but wonder about is, has he ever been exposed to discrimination or exposure to violence or conflict? So we don't know this based on the vignette, but most likely this is what's happened. Um, has his mother been unemployed or interacted with the criminal justice system? Has he, had, has he been exposed to pollution or to climate changes, which further contribute to this um, problem? The interaction of all these factors lead to reduced options, behavioral risk, fact risk factors, physiologic stress response, and psychological stress which then leads to the adverse health outcomes, which are unmasked in the face of a disaster such as the COVID-19 pandemic. The word unmask being the key word. The case of Jamal can be applied to children, any of the groups highlighted here today. Our speakers for today will discuss this um, and the, interac the interaction of healthcare disparities in COVID-19. And to introduce our speakers, we'd like to work on, welcome our moderator, Dr. Melvin Otis. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are and which coast. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlson, for your comments. Thank you so much to our chairs, our, our chairs, Dr. Cheryl Amatine and Dr. Angel Carabajo. Uh, next, we're going to have a presentation by the Asian Caucus. Well, we're so excited to hear from uh, Dr. Annie Lee and from Dr. Jen Cho, who are uh, about to start the presentation regarding the Asian population. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, my name is Jane Cho and I'm co-founder and co-chair of Asian Caucus at ACAP with my counterpart, Annie Lee here. Um, Annie and I will be splitting time to tell you about impact of COVID-19 on Asian Americans today. It's such an honor to be part of this forum with all the other amazing speakers and I do hope that this presentation is helpful for those listening. So COVID-19 has been detrimental for Asian American communities in many different ways. Um, since March, when the pandemic started in China, there's been drastic uprising of racism against Asian Americans. Um, initially started with Uber drivers, rejecting Asian American passengers, but quickly escalated to kicking, spitting, punching, pouring acid on the women, um, stabbing a father and his two and a six-year-old children at a shopping mall. Um, and these uh, acts of violence were not just limited to America, but they were committed against Asians in many other metropolitan cities of the world. So this data from Stop AAPI Hate Reporting Site, um, which is initiated by Dr. Russell Jung of San Francisco State University, um, describes incidents of racial aggression towards Asian Americans starting from March 19th to April 7th. Um, that's about 20 days. So during these 20 days, 14, over 1,400 reports uh, of uh, aggression against Asian American inc um, incidents were reported. So that's an average of 70 incidents a day in these during 20 days. The data shows that women were more likely to be harassed. And what was shocking for me was um, the vast, um, big amount of incidents involved Asian American children and Asian American seniors over age 60. Um, and this has been a very scary time for Asian Americans. So next slide. So how are these events affecting Asian American community? 
There are many outcries of fear and anger and sadness. But what COVID-19 really did um, for Asian Americans is that we started questioning our identity as Asian Americans in this country. So historically, the Asian Americans were stereotyped in different ways. Initially, that we were the yellow peril that posed danger and threat to Western world. Um, in fact, uh, Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 is the first passage in American history where a specific ethnic group was barred from seeking immigration and naturalization. Um, this concept of yellow peril that were unfit, unclean, uh, continued to persist, uh, manifesting in Executive Order 9066 in 1942, when Japanese Americans were incarcerated wrongfully um, during the World War II. And then in 1982, um, Vincent Chen was beaten to death in Detroit by angry car industry workers who had lost their jobs and blamed it in uh, Japanese car industry. Um, it really highlights this yellow peril image of Asian Americans. And by the way, Vincent Chin is not, was not a uh, Japanese American. However, towards the um, 50s and 60s, a new stereotype for Asian Americans emerged, as you know, model minority, where our economical and educational success was juxtaposed against other groups of people of color. Um, Asian, Asian Americans were glorified, and I say glorified because it's not true, um, as industrious, law-abiding people who kept their heads down and never complained. Um, this also coincided with the Immigration Act of 1965, where the law opened um, to immigration for Asian Americans, among others, but it also uh, particularly gave preferential admission to those with higher um, than average level of education. I think, in fact, many of the older immigrant generation of Asian American citizens were beneficiary of this law. So the model minority stereotyping of Asian Americans, while seemingly advantageous, was in reality detrimental for Asian Americans. It excluded Asian Americans from discussion of US culture and diversity. And most importantly, it has systematically set us up against other people of color and has created big animosity in between minority groups, um, as seen very violently in Los Angeles riot in 1992. So at the bottom in 2020 with COVID-19, both of these stereotypes were again highlighted. We're the yellow peril that brings in a plague, but also a model minority who shouldn't be fighting against um, discrimination that we face. And the bottom line is what these events really remind us is that either way, yellow peril or model minority um, we are perpetual foreigners in this country, that we're never gonna be the true American and our belonging here is forever conditional, um, that we're only part of America if we stay submissive, colorless and invisible. Um, so next slide. So our conditional belonging is, is more highlighted in the experiences of our physician colleagues through this pandemic. So many of them are in the front lines treating COVID patients, but they are facing even more blatant and scary xenophobic aggression. So for example, the Washington Post had written an article about the experience of Dr. Lucy Lee. Um, she's an anesthesiology resident at MGH who faced a racist attack on her way home in her scrub after her shift where she had been intubating COVID patients and putting her own safety online. Um, the video that's playing on this slide right now is a powerful YouTube video that a group of Asian American physicians collaborated to point out the struggles that Asian Americans, um, Asian American physicians are facing during this pandemic. Many of the Asian American physicians have shared their stories of patients refusing to be treated by them and being harassed both in the hospital, but also out of the hospital on their way home. The AMC data shows that almost 18% of America's physician force is made up of Asian Americans. Um, these stories of our colleagues, again, um, remind us of our conditional belonging to America. And that even if we work hard, get respectable jobs, stay quiet, 
no matter how successful we are, we can still be shunned and turned away. And these stories of our Asian American physician colleague is the classic presentation of model minority facades that we're seeing right now. Okay, I'm gonna uh, turn over to Annie. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Thank you, Jean. So on the bar graph, I mean, the pie chart that Dr. Cho had mentioned, it actually showed that 17% of Asian America, uh, um, of the United States physician workforce are comprised of Asian Americans. Now, I'm gonna go into that a little bit, but I wanna shift focus, next slide, on the fact that while Asians may be represented in medicine, it's not necessarily applicable in mental health. And I apologize that my slides may go a little bit faster than the way I talk. COVID-19 is happening when there are still persistent mental health disparities in the Asian American community. We know that Asian Americans are one of the largest growing minority group in the United States, comprising of 5.4% of the US population. Now, if we roughly say that 13% of those have a diagnosable mental health condition. That comes out to 2.2 million people. And this is data from 2014. Now, back in 2001, I wanna make sure to click. There were approximately 70 Asian American mental health providers available for 100,000 Asian Americans in the United States in terms of mental health uh, resources. And that's comparable to 173 providers for every 100,000 Caucasians. Now, Dr. Cho and I comprise and crunch some numbers a little bit um, from the data generated in the American Academy of Medical Colleges. And in 2018, we were able to appreciate that there were roughly 5,100 Asian American psychiatrists in the US. That doesn't include whether they may be actively participating or actively practicing, or whether they may be retired or maybe engage in other um, non-clinical pursuits, right? We also have to recognize that when we put all of this together, we have to appreciate that heter uh, Asian Americans are really heterogeneous group comprising of people comp uh, making up of different languages, cultural, religious values and differ, right? So that being said, of that 17% of physicians that are Asian Americans, only 3% of those are actually psychiatrists. And if we look at all the US psychiatry workforce, Asian Americans only make up 10% of that total workforce. Um, and that highlights the fact that there are um, workforce shortages in the minority groups. The other thing I wanna shed light on is the fact that Asian American youth, according to data generated from SAMHSA, are the minority group that's least likely to utilize mental health services um, in the US. And we have an arrow pointing out to that, right? That compared to all the minority groups, Asians, 5.9% um, of Asians um, are, act, are, are recipients of mental health services. And you look at other uh, minority groups that are actually receiving mental health services at a higher rate. So knowing all of these health disparities, what do we do about them? Next slide. We have to recognize and address that there are barriers at large ensuring that the mental health needs of the Asian American youth and community are met. And there are many barriers. One of them that I wanna talk about is stigma. While we have made tremendous gains in the past few years um, to, to, to kind of shed light on how stigma plays a role in mental health access, the reality is, is that mental health continues to be um, perceived in a negative light and that it's more of a reflection of a character rather than a condition. Dr. Cho really articulated very well the minor minority myth, right, which perpetuates the stereotype of high achieving success and it places tremendous expectations on our youths, which leads to an increased amounts of stress. And we all know that that leads to potentially higher rates of depression and anxiety. Not only that, though, that our youths also experience acts of discrimination uh, when, when we talk about the minor, model minority myth. And that's something that we have to consider for our patient population. Along with low mental health literacy is the idea of differences in generation of experiences of hardship. And often becomes a, de um, a detriment for a lot of Asian American youth because parents and elders, especially if they're coming from home countries that experience war, poverty, and trauma, may have a tendency to dismiss their children's distress. Right, saying, well, we have, we want, we've gone through so much more when we were kids. You should be so grateful for what you have. There's no reason for you to be depressed or anxious. We talked a little bit about the workforce shortage and the language barrier, um, and that came really into play um, when one of our colleagues, my colleague Dr. Yao, 
um, she was redeployed um, to our lower Manhattan campus in uh, near Presbyterian, where it was predominantly a lot of Chinese populations. And there were many families who were going through loss of loved ones through COVID-19. And we were trying to identify any um, you know, mental health um, providers who could be able to help meet the needs of the um, grieving families in bereavement. And we had to mobilize across the country to be able to identify uh, the, um, <clears throat> those, um, those uh, uh, resources and help. Then there is the concerns of lack of affordable mental health services and insurances um, that we need to address on a very legislative level. And then for those who are engaging in research, we have to remind ourselves that when we aggregate all the data, right, um, amongst Asian Americans, right, it may not highlight um, epidemiologically inaccuracy of treatment modalities and outcomes, because we have to recognize that Asian Americans is a really heterogeneous group. So we need to kind of work on desegregating, de-aggregating the data so that we can provide more greater accuracy in terms of epidemiological and um, you know, study approaches. So knowing all of these barriers, right, there's a lot to be done. Um, and I want to put on the action steps, right? These are some of the things that we came up with. I can imagine that there's probably so much more. And the first and foremost is important is that we need to ask and listen. And, and, and you know, create a space for the experiences of Asian Americans who are facing discrimination to be shared, expressed, and discussed, and often even needs to be validated. Another step is bystander intervention. I'm a New York subway rider. If you see something, say something. And now more than ever, we need to do that. We also need to debunk the model minority myth because for all the reasons that Dr. Cho described, I would also want to add that it's a really divisive construct that pits one minority group against the other. And this is not a time where we should be doing that. It's a time where we should, all of us needing to ally, empower, and fight systemic racism and address it as a public health crisis and concern. If you're in a position of leadership and your respective institutions, make it a priority to recruit Asian Americans in your pipeline and work to retain faculty members who can continue to do this work. And that's actually a core mission of the AUCAP Asian Caucus. I would also encourage all of us um, and to in, in, you know, um, remind our patients and their families to participate in the census 2020 and then collaborate um, and organize and mobilize our effort to be able to make systemic changes on a legislative level. And I'm really grateful for the Asian, um, the American Academy to provide the Asian um, American ca Asian caucus for us to do that and to be able to collaborate at an all systems level. So next slide. So I want you guys to take home with five things that you can do tomorrow. One is to check in on your Asian American colleagues. As Dr. Carlson mentioned, this is a syndemic, and I personally have been on the road of both a recovering from COVID and also being um, experiencing acts of discrimination in my own community. So we want, and sometimes I'm not doing well, and we all need to be reminding ourselves that we got to check in with one another and support all the physicians that are in the front line doing that work. Next is to be able to check in with our patients and families and do the same thing that we would be doing to our Asian colleagues. Three, encourage our families to report these acts of bias and hate. I had to do it last weekend. It's very empowering because we need that data to pursue advocacy movements. Contact number four, contact the ACAP Advocacy Committee and work together in a systemic way to address change. And also empower yourself as an individual, as a physician, as a as a, as a citizen to uh, reach out to your local legislators. And I want to highlight House Resolution 908, which is urging Congress to condemn any anti-Asian sentiments and hate related to COVID-19. And I would all encourage all of our Asian young patient, um, uh, adult patients to really participate in the census this year, really important, and to go out there and vote in a critical election year. Thank you both from the Asian Caucus for presenting such a dynamic and compelling presentation. It reminds us all to empower our empower our patients and our families. So thank you both. Next, we're going to have Dr. Balkazar Adam present for the International Medical Caucus. Thank you so much uh, for your words today as she begins to join us right now. Reminding you all that there's a question feature in which you can submit your questions to all of the panelists. Thank you, Dr. Adam. Hello everyone. My name is Balthazar Adam. I work with the University of Missouri Columbia. 
Today, I would like to share with you some of the challenges faced by international medical graduates and the immigrant communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. I am delighted to be here and I am pleased you made time to connect with us from wherever you are. These are my disclosures. I think it was mentioned earlier, I work with the University of Missouri. I am the recipient of two advocacy and collaboration grants, and I got travel support from the ROCAP and from the APA. My objectives for today is to help the participant understand the factors affecting immigrant communities while facing COVID-19, and to learn stressor, especially faced by non-citizen IMGs and discuss the possible impact of COVID on child psychiatrist shortage and address the well-being of international medical graduates. I would like also to share what of the IMG caucus members have done and present some recommendations. Some patients in immigrant communities have language barriers, which lead to difficulty while dealing with the doctors. Providers have tried to be creative while addressing this during the, visual, the virtual visits. Some used software that had built-in interpreter. However, this is not a perfect solution and using the internet can be challenging. Sometimes Wi-Fi and Google Translate freeze. The family may have no data and no Wi-Fi to use during the visit, and the background noise at their home may interfere with the communication. It was noted that some of the immigrant communities prefer to use WhatsApp during the visit because it's free. The parents who do not have a phone with camera may have children who have school-issued laptops or iPads that can be useful. So the doctors and the parents use this device and connect through different apps. The doctor may then use their desk phone to place the translator on a speaker to facilitate the session. In Missouri, many of our immigrant and refugee community are hesitant to get tested or receive treatment because of their worries about the public charge rule, which may affect their permanent residency status. Some of the immigrants from Africa that I work with tell me that they view that struggling with mental illness could be a sign of weakness. The typical stress relieving outlets such as soccer games are canceled and they are not able to visit with their family and their friends. Besides, it can be overwhelming for parents to uh, homeschool their children. And with reduced work hours and job losses, they are facing more financial stress. In addition, Misinformation is a problem across the board with COVID, but I have seen that even more with some of the immigrant population. Some have questions about how COVID is contracted and transmitted, and they receive many of their information through WhatsApp, which could be unreliable. I have personally seen some WhatsApp groups claiming that COVID is a lie. Now, I would like to share some of the experiences immigrant communities is uh, facing in different states. In Foster, Mississippi, the community is still recovering from the largest workplace immigration raid. It's no wonder they are not comfortable going to see a doctor or a hospital because they are worried about possible confrontation with authorities. In addition, the recent change in border rules and administration deporting 
hundreds of immigrant children alone, 600 of them in April, is deeply troubling. Imagine the extreme horror Gerson and his mother felt when she sent him alone to cross the river with a stranger, hoping he would reach his uncle. But nobody heard from him for six days until his mother received a call from her cousin in Honduras telling her that he is there, the place that she was trying to protect him from its violence. Across the country, next slide please. Across the country, we see health disparities in COVID over and over again. In Minnesota, one example where these disparities are reflected is in language. 22% of the people who tested positive required an interpreter. However, that is more than five times the rate of people needing interpreter in normal healthcare setting. Interpreter then needed to have additional training on explaining the medical terms to the patient. In some countries, if you got a gunshot wound, you have to get the money first, or you are going to bleed to death in the waiting room of the hospital. This may be contributing to what we observed in Illinois. Some immigrant population will often wait till they are near birth. They are near death before they go to the hospital. They worry that they might get a hospital bill and they will not be able to pay for it. Some of the challenges and fears observed in immigrant families are mirrored in the IMG doctors treating them. On the professional level, like everyone else, they are dealing with increased intensity and stress at work. Some of them struggle with visa and having a, a valid visa. And they worry about their plans for the future, for themselves and for their dependents. They wonder, will they be able to work here or will they have to go back to their country? On the family's level, the April executive order halting immigration for 60 days is affecting the spouses, the children, and the relative of green card holders who were out of the country on April 22nd. This order may even be extended. Because of the travel restriction, they are not able to visit their countries abroad and their family are not able to come and visit them. I know of a close friend that he almost lost his mother. She was in, in ICU dying and he could not go and visit her. On the financial level, they worry about their car payment, their mortgage, their children's education. Job loss, furlough, and pay cuts are happening more and more. IMG are playing a critical role in healthcare during this pandemic. At this time, we need to increase the healthcare capacity and to loosen restrictions. Especially, we already have shortage in child psychiatry even before the pandemic. However, they are dealing with a lot of difficulties. The um, new IMGs are scheduled to start in July, but they are not able to do that at times. We have one of our own residents facing trouble leaving their native country at this time. I hear about challenges finding, finding J-1 visa waiver jobs, and some universities are freezing hiring for new faculty members. It is expected that the upcoming interview of trainee will most likely be virtual, which may be more challenging for IMGs. The uh, travel and visa restrictions may be another by barrier for employment of IMGs. Our healthcare system relies on IMG, who make up 30% of practicing psychiatrists 
and over 30% of psychiatrists in training. Immigration policies are adding unneeded limitation to IMG physicians and restricting their abilities to help during this critical time. They face more roadblocks. They have difficulty securing appointment at US consulates and the travel restriction and the limited flights to the US is keeping some of them from coming here. Many IMGs are impacted by delays in their visa processing, although this has started moving on a few days ago. And some who have J1 and H1B visa need to be renewed before the end of this uh, academic year. In addition, as a specialty, we are in need of the G1 waiver jobs, which allow the foreign-born psychiatrists to play a crucial role while serving patients in underserved areas. However, there are a few things that soften the blow, but not enough. There are steps to lift visa hold to boost the physician workforce during COVID. There are also steps to extend the grace period from 60 days to 180 days for those who lost their jobs. And the executive order that halt immigration for 60 days exclude physicians. However, everyone's situation is unique and the anxiety and fears that faced some of IMG is very real. Our patients are definitely impacted by COVID. They are at high risk for anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and suicide. The report of continued loss of life, financial hardship, and isolation is adding stress to the children and their family. The children are worried about contracting the, the coronavirus and about their family's health. All this leads to an increased need for doctors to respond to the overwhelming needs of our patients. I was pleased to see the ACAP support IMG effort during this critical time. ACAP joined other organizations to urge US citizenship and immigration services to temporarily extend IMG visa automatically for one year, resume the premium processing, and expedite approval of extension and change of status. The ACAP is reviewing the current two petitions. One is Healthcare Workforce Resilience Act, which seek recapturing of 15,000 unused immigration visa for foreign doctors. And the second is protect healthcare in medically underserved communities, which support the Conrad 30 program and the G1 visa jobs. The ACAP provided multiple opportunities to increase awareness of IMG's needs, including this presentation. For your convenience, this is an easy access to these petitions. The IMG caucus immediately took action because of how COVID is affecting our patient and our ability to care for them. We informed our local row cap and APA chapter, and we wrote articles and planned presentations. Next slide. In addition, we distributed this two petition to psychiatrists and requested their support. We collaborated with other IMG caucus leaders and met as a caucus to explore needs and interventions. Moving on to recommendations. Dr. Carson mentioned we are a community of colleagues. I encourage you to ask your colleagues how they are doing and what can be done to support them. We need to increase awareness of the challenges faced by IMG and the immigrant communities and understand the needs of the immigrant and the refugee communities. We need to collect the data on what's happening now to learn what is needed in the future. 
We need to increase communication, write articles, present, and find various ways to spread the word. We also need to collaborate with other organizations so we can all provide support to IMGs and the immigrant communities. On the advocacy level, we need to garner support from leaders of psychiatry and other community leaders. And we need to support the two petition. I ask you to please consider doing that. We need to contact our local legislator as well as work with the ACAPS Advocacy Committee and Advocacy Liaison to help establish priorities. There is much more that needs to be done, but I will end here for now. And thank you for your listening. Have a good thank day. Thank you so much, Dr. Bratudar Adam, for your wonderful presentation, uh, for all the considerations we have to have for our international medical graduates that are working very hard in the field. Next, we're going to have a presentation from the Rural Committee, uh, but uh, Dr. Thomas Hoffman is up next. So thank you, Dr. Thomas, for your presentation. I remind you all to put your question to submit your questions. Some are being answered uh, live, and we'll also get them at the end as well. We can't hear you yet, sir. There we go. Well, it's a privilege to be here, and I thank um, the invitation to speak here on rural issues. So thank you to everybody for an excellent group of presentations so far. Next slide, please. I will take a few seconds to thank the members of the Rural Psychiatry Committee and its contributors in helping think through and discuss content for this presentation. And special thanks go to John Diamond, my co-chair. Next slide, please. First, I thought it would be important to make sure that we understand what is considered rural and what is not considered rural. And I looked to the United States Census Bureau to clarify that answer for us. Unfortunately, I do not believe the answer they provided was really that clear at all. As you can already see, their definition of rural is any population, housing, or territory not in an urban area. While I do not believe it is best to define something by what it is not, I guess that is what we are forced to do in this case. So, to better understand what is rural, let's look at what urban is defined as. According to the United States Census Bureau, there are two definitions of urban areas. Areas with a population of 50,000 or more are considered urbanized, and urban clusters contain a population of at least 2,500 and less than 50,000 people. I still do not believe that this is the clearest picture of what rural is, even though the numbers do kind of spell it out. While the information that the Census Bureau uses to define rural versus urban is more complicated than just population data, I will stay fairly general for the sake of this presentation. Additionally, definitions change with each census. Regardless, I think this map from the Census Bureau is helpful. This map depicts urban areas and urban clusters according to 2010 census data. This map will most likely change this year as we undergo our decennial census count. Let me put some of this in perspective, particularly as it pertains to children in rural areas before we address the impact of coronavirus. And this data is all from various sources within the United States Census Bureau. According to the 2010 census, Rural areas cover 97% of the nation's land area, but contain only 19.3% of the population. According to data released in December 2016, 13.4 million children under the age of 18 lived in rural areas. Children in rural areas had lower rates of poverty, 18.9% versus 22.3%, but more children in rural areas are uninsured, 7.3% versus 6.3%. Next slide, please. If we focus specifically on children mental health in rural areas, studies suggest that rates of mental illness in children are comparable to those of children in urban areas, although there are only limited studies comparing the prevalence of disorders in these regions. Despite that, according to a study from 2015, from 1996 through 2010, suicide rates for use in rural areas 
were approximately double those in urban areas for both males and females. During this time, male suicide rates significantly declined in the most urban areas while not changing in rural areas, suggesting that there may be a widening rural and urban disparity. There are also a number of barriers to treatments that further complicate the provision of mental health care in rural communities, but that is really outside of the scope of what we are talking about today. Hopefully, though, I've been successful in communicating that rural settings had already faced challenges prior to the current pandemic. Next slide, please. And while well, anyone in a rural setting will tell you that lack of access to child psychiatrists is a barrier to care, really, there is a nationwide shortage of child psychiatrists in essentially all places in the nation. This map, which is from data provided by ACAP and represents workforce data as of 2018, shows that areas of red have a severe shortage of child psychiatrists, which is most of the nation. The only green spot on the map, which indicates a mostly sufficient supply of child psychiatrists, is Washington, D.C. Next slide, please. So let's shift our focus to coronavirus and the impact it has had on delivery of mental health care in rural settings. The short version of this story is that I don't believe we really know yet, as the situation is evolving, particularly with movements to reopen the nation. But that would be a really boring and abrupt way to end this portion of the presentation. Additionally, it is hard to say what we expected to come from the virus. Initially, I think it was viewed as a non-United States problem, then it hit here, but in more populated areas. And while it is clear that the virus has spread throughout the country at this point, I find it interesting that the kids that I work with in a rural setting really have no anxiety about the virus. Also, many of the children I have worked with have had no impact directly from the virus from an illness standpoint outside of stressors related to not going to school or other economic or, or impacts that they have faced with their families. So let's try to dig a little dip deeper and see if we can identify some of those disparities. Across the nation, the response in our field was relatively similar. We stopped seeing patients in our offices and instead switched to telehealth when possible. Next slide, please. Many people used various applications to see their patients in ways different than many of us have been used to. Zoom, DoxyMe, VC, and GoToMeeting are just a few examples of platforms that are being used, but they are dependent on people's abilities to connect to them, which requires adequate internet access. The map shown in this slide is data from the FCC dated December 2017. It is focused on residential fixed internet access service connections per 100 households. I apologize, this is a map does not include Alaska or Hawaii. For all areas in this map, the definition of access is at least 10 megabits per second down and one megabit per second up. Why is that important? In order to support adequate video connections, there needs to be adequate connection speed. Zoom recommends 1.5 megabits per second up and down, DoxyMe requires at least two up and down, and recommends above 10 to 15. GoToMeeting recommends at least one megabit per second up and down. I'm sorry if that was a little bit technical, but the take home message is that speed matters for quality of connections. In the map above, white is defined as no fixed internet access with this speed based on numbers of connections per 1,000 households. Each color level represents an increase by 20%. So the lightest shade of yellow represents 0 to 20% of homes with fixed access, and darkest brown represents over 80% of homes with fixed access. Next slide, please. Now, if we place the Census Bureau map next to the FCC map, it is probably not terribly surprising to see that there are similarities, similarities in the density of coloration between the two. It does appear that people in rural areas are less likely to have access to adequate, for that matter, any broadband connections. One factor that this does not take into consideration is the availability of mobile broadband access. I did not specifically look at cellular coverage maps for the sake of this presentation. From my own experience, I have found that the quality of coverage maps may be exaggerated. And while I have no question that mobile data opens up access to folks, rural areas are still limited in access. Using myself as an example, I commute 60 miles one way via the interstate each day to work. I do live in Montana. Anyway, about a quarter of that route has no signal at all, let alone data coverage. Next slide, please. 
Now, please don't take this as me saying that kids in rural areas have no hope because they do not have access to the internet. In fact, I think that there may be some positives from this experience. Next slide, please. There are published opinions that definitely support the use of electronic means of communications during the COVID era, and we really should be making efforts to utilize them to extend care when possible. There are also a multitude of ways in which we may be able to interact with our patients, and I suspect that moving forward, some of these methods may become more standard as we learn the nuances of providing care through these different means. It is far outside the scope of this presentation to address reimbursement for services rendered through some of these modalities, and I will leave it to people smarter than I am to figure that out. But I know that there has been relaxation of rules regarding some of these modalities during the pandemic. Regardless, finding ways to engage in both rural and urban areas remains incredibly important. Next slide, please. Another aspect of COVID-19 that has impacted the potential treatment of people in rural areas is variability in the infrastructure that exists in these areas. Here you can see a typical hospital ward in Montana. Next slide, please. Since 2005, approximately 160 rural hospitals have closed due to a multitude of reasons, resulting in overall reduced hospital availability for those in rural settings. Additionally, it can be challenging to get people to hospitals due to limitations of reliable transportation over large distances. Many rural hospitals are under-equipped. Rural hospitals have only 1% of ICU bed availability in the nation. Additionally, it can be extremely challenging to staff rural hospitals. Urban medical centers, which were expected to see more cases due to population density, may not be able to accept referrals from outlying hospitals. Another factor of staffing is that Personnel are comparatively older than their urban counterparts, which makes them just as susceptible to the disease. Fortunately, in many rural areas, the impact of the virus did not create situations in which capacity was overwhelmed, despite planning. In my state of Montana, for example, we are prepared as a state to open surge hospitals and field hospitals, but the need did not materialize to do so. Next slide, please. There have been concerns that with higher unemployment rates due to shutdowns, that there may be a more evident worsening of the poverty rate. This could lead to non-adherence to social distancing simply so that people can make ends meet. Additionally, there were concerns that due to more limitations and availability of supplies, shortages may hit harder and that commodities may not be as available in areas that have limited access to stores. During this pandemic, 43 states issued stay-at-home orders. Seven states, Arkansas, Iowa, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming did not. Most of them did restrict some places such as bars and restaurants, and only South Dakota issued no businesses closed, but provided recommendations to reduce spread. These states have many areas that fall under rural classification. I believe that many of the closures were not implemented in order to protect businesses, but also because rural areas did not expect to see the demands that more urban areas had. Even so, many of the decisions to not order stay at home were considered controversial. Next slide, please. When the virus first hit, we saw a shortage of toilet paper, and I am convinced that early studies demonstrated the only way to prevent infection was to surround oneself in a toilet paper fortress at least six rolls deep, assuming that the rolls were two ply. I digress. These are some of the impacts of the virus that we are seeing amongst children in the pandemic. Note that none of these are specific to a rural setting and indeed are likely to exist for many children in any setting. Schools were largely closed across the nation. For some kids, school is an outlet from trauma and abuse at home. There are worries that abuse may go unnoticed and unreported, particularly with increasing parental stressors related to the pandemic. It may be harder for children to access care, not only because of broadband internet access concerns as already discussed in rural settings, but because transportation options may be more limited and financial constraints may prevent people from being able to tra travel to in-person appointments if they can get them. Additionally, resources may be more limited in rural settings due to a lack of places to shop. If the town's, town's only store closes down, people will have trouble accessing food and other necessary supplies. One factor of restrictions that were put into place is that health literacy may be lower in rural areas. This is certainly not saying that people in rural areas are not able to understand what is happening and the reasons behind restrictions, but fewer people were directly impacted by the virus itself. 
As I mentioned earlier, kids that I am seeing only rarely mention anxiety about the illness. I have not personally been impacted by the illness and do not know anyone that has had the virus or had anyone close to them that has had the virus, which I am sure is very different than my urban colleagues. I believe this represents, or excuse me, presents challenges in rural areas in that it may be harder to convince people that restrictions in place that do clearly impact day to day living are important. Next slide, please. Now, I've not been a glowing ray of sunshine today, but there may be some good news too. One unexpected aspect of the virus that we have seen in some areas is that it may have actually led to increased access to care. For instance, some hospitals reduce inpatient capacity to ensure social distancing with patients and also due to staffing concerns to protect staff that may be at increased risk from infection with the virus. When this happened though, it has allowed for a shift to increase outpatient clinical resources via telehealth and has allowed waiting lists for services within communities to start to shrink. Realistically, COVID-19 cases are lower in rural areas than they are in urban areas. As an example, using my home state of Montana, as of this morning, there have been 588 cases, 18 deaths, 60 active cases, seven active hospitalizations, and only 77 total hospitalizations. Across the state, there are 24 counties out of a total of 56 counties that have had no cases. The counties with the most cases, as might be expected, are for the most part areas with the largest populations. The lack of cases seen in rural areas could be a double-edged sword in some ways. While it is good that rates may be low, it may also contribute to a false sense of security and people may not feel as compelled to distance themselves from others. There may be more temptation to ignore social distancing or closure guidelines in place. And so while that may not be great news for viral containment, it may help mitigate some of the isolation that children and others are experiencing. Next slide, please. As I said earlier, I think we have yet to see the true impact of this virus and how it will impact children in both rural and urban areas. Probably the most consistently reported disparity between rural and urban settings right now is the lack of access to care, and really this existed before the virus. But internet access is not always obtainable in rural settings, which makes it harder to access when we are living in a virtual world. Thank you for attending this forum, and I hope you found this portion helpful. Dr. Hoffman, thank you so much for that presentation. This is very helpful for us all. And next, we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Susan Daly of the Native American Child Committee. Uh, thank you so much. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for holding this forum and allowing us to share information. I'm going to begin talking about the Native American experience. This is basically a reenactment of historical trauma for Native American populations. The next slide, please. The epidemics that raged in Native America um, were awful, and the majority of the loss of population for American Indians, Alaskan Natives, and Native Hawaiians were from disease, not from war or relocation. All those those were just as bad. Um, if you look at the list, next please. Smallpox was the number one killer, but the rest of these illnesses were part of the problem, including mumps and measles and whooping cough. The next please graph shows that where there was an estimated population of close to 70 million, within a couple of hundred years of contact, initial contact with Europeans, the population had fallen to less than 1 million and was just in a couple a hundred thousand at 1900. Next slide. The whole section of the Caribbean, entire nations were wiped out by these diseases. So this is still a very strong memory as the Cherokee, the Blackfeet, the Mandan, all were hit by this. Next please. This shows an estimated population loss for Hawaii and this is over just about 150 years from initial contact with Captain Cook <clears throat> the first darker line is for the Swanson estimation. The Kamakamea school um, is estimating those with any portion of Hawaiian blood, but the numbers are still awful. At least they're rising now. Next slide, please. So currently we have 574 federally recognized tribes, 62 state recognized tribes. These include Alaskan, Hawaiian, Pacific Island territories and Pacific Island countries aligned with the United States. That makes for about 2.6 million individuals. 
Next, please. Healthcare provision for all of these started with a treaty with the United States that guaranteed that we would have all proper care and protection. The next time there was a major step was in 1975, back please, thank you, uh, with the Indian Self-Determination and Education Act, which created a 638 contract, which allows tribes to set up their own health care contracting and provision of services with a slight adaptation to add urban Indian health centers since the majority of native population currently resides in urban centers, not on the reservations. The feds have allowed $3,943 per person for Indian health care. Now this is about half of what they allow for federal prison individuals. Next slide. Currently, the highest shortage area in Indian health is behavioral health needs. Suicide is the second leading cause of death and 3.5 times higher than the next lowest ethnic rates. Substance abuse is the highest of any ethnic group, and that includes all types of substance, alcohol, methamphetamines, opioids. They have the highest lifetime prevalence of major depression amongst adolescents ages 12 to 17 years of age, and it's a 70% greater likelihood that they're going to be identified as emotionally disturbed in school. Next, please. So when we're talking about this pandemic, COVID-19, the Navajo term for it is the cough that kills. Next, please. When we talk about the numbers, we really don't know. They break down the numbers for Asian, for Hispanic, for African-American, a variety of different races, but they don't count Native individuals. So we don't know the true numbers unless we go to a specific reservation. Next, please. What are the contagion factors for our native population? They include uh, poverty, dire poverty. One of the poorest places in the United States is on a Native American reservation. The second poorest is on a Native American reservation. The third poorest is a Native American reservation. And the numbers go on. They have poor public health infrastructure, as noted above. It's never funded adequately. And they have inadequate health services. There is no running water on much of the property. Uh, malnourishment, uh, lots of junk food when they have it, uh, substance and alcohol abuse. It goes on and on. Next, please. Each nation has a different set of resources, depending on if they're IHS dependent or if they are having a 638. Some places have both um, that shared responsibilities. Nations range in size from hundreds to 400,000. Actually, one of the sub-tribes only has eight members, seven are children. Physical accessibility is limited. Physical resources are limited. Next, please. When we look at the risk factors, the numbers I could find showed that 22% of the native population is over uh, the age of 65, half qualify as obese, about a quarter have diabetes already, we have chronic kidney disease, liver disease, and then you add the substance abuse on top of that. Next, please. Different tribes have taken different steps. Examples, a lot of people are familiar with the Cheyenne River Sioux who put up roadblocks, which the South Dakota governor then said needed to come down. They didn't come down, by the way. Um, some of the more isolated locations, such as Arctic Village and Fort Yukon in Alaska, have basically shut down. The bush pilots aren't going in unless they're bringing in health care supplies or individuals. Everybody is restricted. This has had huge impacts on these small communities, but they also haven't had a case yet. Red Lake Nation in Minnesota is using the typical curfew travel ban closures. Everybody's doing the stay at home orders, food deliveries, provision of PPE, et cetera. Next, please. Specifically, I want to look at the Navajo Nation. We have good numbers there, but I will tell you that the, I am updating these on a daily basis. So this is a 27,000 square mile semi-autonomous territory. It covers over three states. There's about 350,000 people. About 40% of the homes have no running water. So this wash your hands recommendation, they also don't have toilets. So 15% live in extreme poverty. This doesn't include the ones that live in just poverty there's over a 50% unemployment rate. There's no postal or package delivery. You can't ask Amazon to bring what you need there. Next. There are about 14 separate healthcare facilities. 12 are run by IHS and two are tribal. For this entire area, there are two 
child psychiatrist. Next. So this is a look at what's happening with the case rate. Uh, as I'm up, gonna update this, the last number on here is on 610. As of last night, there have been 33,844 tested out of 350,000 plus people. There have been 6,470 cases, 3,000 have recovered and 303 have died. Now this is looking at Arizona in particular, the native population is 5% of the population and over 20% of the deaths from coronavirus. Next please. So this is showing the death rate. It is still climbing. Next, please. So these are the numbers from a couple of days ago. I just gave you the new ones. Now, Doctors Without Borders, before this got so bad, knew that it was going to get so bad that they sent two teams. Here in the United States, we have two Doctors Without Borders teams on the Navajo Nation. Next, please. So who are we losing? We're losing elders. We're losing traditional medicine practitioners. There were only 300 left at the start of this. I don't know how many are left now. And we're losing role models, artists, traditional dancers. We're losing a culture. Dr. Livingston? Uh, she's showing you a medicine wheel. The um... I'm, my heritage is Cherokee. The, our medicine wheel is a little different. We have black to the west and uh, red to the east. We have uh, blue to the north and yellow or white to the south. The medicine wheel is a pan-Indian thing. There are other things that are pan-Indian that, that apply across all of the diversity of, of nations, like my ribbon shirt here. Uh, it's decorated with ribbon, so it's a ribbon shirt. This is something that, that's used in all kind of different uh, nations. Uh, for, for all of the nations, there was $8 billion that was appropriated for COVID treatment and diagnosis uh, for the Indians. And so far, as of last night, not a penny of it has actually reached any of the tribes. So uh, there's a, an area where some politics needs to be hammered on a little bit. We have limited power. That's another thing to cope with. Um, several of the organizations that, that I work with have been having listening sessions with the different uh, tribal organizations and centers trying to find out what COVID is doing to the communities. And we're hearing the same things. Uh, I've, I've participated in three of those and I've heard the same things from three different centers. Uh, we're hearing the same things we hear whenever there's a big stress or we're hearing uh, isolation, we're hearing domestic violence, we're hearing suicide. There are uh, suicidal behaviors and potential suicide clusters developing that, that people don't want to talk about it because they don't want to call attention to it again, but it's, it's happening. Uh, people in isolation, it's hard to do telemedicine like Tom was saying, it's hard to do telemedicine when there's no tele. It's hard to do telemedicine when there's no infrastructure for it. You got to get, uh, you, you got to have a way to get the, get to the people somehow. Uh, to do these listening sessions, we had to gather groups of people in community centers where there was some kind of, uh, usually telephone, and it could be done as a conference call. Uh, but Indians have been coping with this. It's uh, in some ways it's not new. Um, so the the other thing about Indian coping is that it sees everything as part of the same. I'm, you know, medicine is not very separated from the rest of the world. Spirit is spirit and uh, spirituality is built in. Uh, we wake up every day and try to be grateful for what we can be grateful for. Um, we talk about, and, and I think all of the nations talk about this, what are the things that rise up to the heavens? Well, the eagle, part of the reason we respect the grandfather of birds is because he can fly higher than everybody else. Our songs uh, rise up, our prayers rise up, 
uh, smoke from a smudge bundle rises up. Smoke is purifying. Uh, this is a smudge bundle. Everybody's seen this one place or another. There's a meme now going around, which I think is hilarious. It's the uh, the size smudge bundle that's going to be required to purify 2020. It's enormous. It looks like it's big enough that it would take eight, six or eight people to hold it up. Um, and that's another thing that Indians do for coping is to find a way to laugh at everything. Um, you know, and we've been trying to laugh it off since 1492. Um, if you if you look if you look on uh, Facebook, for example, you see another kind of interesting coping mechanism. Uh, people dance for healing. You can't dance in a powwow if people can't get together to powwow, but there's something really interesting called social isolation powwow. And if you look on Facebook at social isolation powwow, you'll see individuals dancing for healing. And you can, uh, you can appreciate what they're doing. And, uh, sort of be wowed by that. And there's tremendous numbers of people that put on their regalia and dance for healing. Uh, if you're lucky enough to go to a powwow, um, at some point during the powwow, there is a, a dance called a round dance. And in the round dance, uh, everything is a circle and in the circle for the round dance everybody is invited to dance so the red Indians and the white Indians and the brown Indians and the black Indians all dance together and uh, that's where you begin to understand the Lakota phrase midaku oyasing which means all my relations but what it really means is we are all related Thank you for listening. This this book, I want to point this out before we leave. This book is available. Uh, it's a wonderful book about COVID. It's from the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health. You can download it and read it, and you should. It'll apply to a lot of different populations. Thank you so much, Dr. Livingston and Dr. Daly, for a very powerful presentation. Uh, we look forward to you answering some questions at the end as well. Next, we have Dr. Fortuna, Dr. Lisa Fortuna, uh, speaking for the Latinx Hispanic Caucus. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fortuna. Okay, unmuted. Thank you. It has been unmuted. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, I want to um, first thank all the provide uh, the presenters who've come before me. Um, very um, important information and, and moving. Um, and I, um, I'm going to be presenting on uh, the Latino or Latinx community uh, and COVID-19. And I, I also want to um, offer gratitude for the uh, Latinx or Hispanic uh, uh, caucus who have assisted me with this presentation. Uh, next. Um, this is just a mural that I wanted to present here in San Francisco, where I hope we can gather um, at some point, uh, uh, potentially in some form with our uh, annual conference. Um, but this is a, a mural that's in the Mission District, uh, which is a, a, um, a community in, in San Francisco with a, a relatively um, large, even though gentrifying, uh, Latino population, multi-ethnic, multiracial. Um, uh, populations um, and definitely an immigrant prop population. Um, and here we see a mural where it says fronteras were made for dividing us. Um, and if you come to the mission, there's a lot of uh, messaging um, through art and murals in particular uh, that talk about the, uh, the social issues that we have at hand in terms of immigration um, and race and justice. So next. Um, you know, what, what was impacting Latino communities in terms of disparities? Um, 
the usual suspects um, that a lot of our communities face in terms of uh, obstacles to care, um, including lack of insurance, under insurance um, when you are insured, um, lack of diversity among our providers and culturally appropriate care, um, all the socioeconomic barriers that we've been talking about, um, as well as immigration policies, which, which instill fear in, in people accessing um, medical care as well as other social services. Um, and distrust of the healthcare system in many cases that you know, do relate to historical trauma and structural inequities where people have been uh, mistreated in healthcare uh, environments, including our mental health uh, context. Um, and then there's also for those hospitals and, and, and uh, community-based organizations that do provide uh, mental health and health care, um, an inadequate support for mental health services and a lack of um, uh, sufficient providers to be able to provide the, the kind of care that is of quality, uh, offers access um, and cultural um, humility. Uh, next slide. Um, I've been, uh, you know, I'll talk a bit about San Francisco, but first, you know, we can think about even New York City, which was uh, a major epicenter for COVID-19. And here, you know, it gives us a bit of the of the flavor that we've all been hearing about in terms of um, the rates of um, COVID-19 um, infections, um, hospitalizations, um, and then people who known to have died. Um, and in New York City, we have also, you know, when we have the data, right, on racial and ethnic um, breakdown. Um, and we can see here that Black and African American populations um, have been hit the hardest in all those realms in New York City, um, and then Latino and Hispanic uh, right under there. Um, but of course, there's, there's a need for more data on really what are the racial ethnic backgrounds, as even we described um, in terms of Native American populations which there is a lot of intersectionality, obviously, in race um, and ethnicity in the Latino population. Um, next slide. Um, in San Francisco, um, the highest concentrations were in the Mission, um, where we saw that mural, um, and the Bayview, which are both um, populations that are um, the Mission, again, Latino, and the Bayview, um, Latino, and a, and a large, a relatively large African-American population, again, with a lot of gentrification. Um, in the Mission District, they did an epidemiological study. Um, they tested almost 3,000 people um, in particular. Um, and what we found was that 45% of those tested uh, were Latinx. And of those tested uh, most, 95% of those tested positive were Latinx. Um, they did do some analysis and they, uh, the reasons or some of the uh, predictors of, um, as you can imagine, were around congregate living, uh, multiple housemates uh, were because of the high cost of living um, here, people living in very tight quarters, um, sick contact, contacts who have not been tested um, and who uh, provided a sort of non-symptomatic transmission, um, and many not eligible then after that for unemployment benefits or, um, or other uh, aid, which uh, relied on um, them having to go to work. Um, and so what we really have found is that really in the San Francisco area, the greatest, the grocery, the domestic, the janitorial work, all the people that were working so that everyone else could shelter in place, uh, a, a good proportion were from Latinx um, and including docu undocumented populations. Um, next. And, you know, as was mentioned um, in our, from our colleagues uh, in terms of Native American context, I think, you know, something that we've really seen as well is that, that we've had tremendous hit in terms of our elders, our matriarchs, our patriarchs. 57% um, of seniors, over 60% um, in, in California are people of color. Um, and that includes uh, Latino, African American, um, and Asian. Um, and what we found is that 70% of deaths in that age group are persons of color. Um, so even though uh, uh, elders are at risk um, medically and for other reasons uh, to have worse uh, illness with COVID-19, um, we know also that there has been a disproportionate hit um, in communities of color, even within that age group. Uh, next. And then we all have heard about the challenges to our children and the schools, um, the rapid implementation, disparities of technology, um, access and the right access. I mean, a lot of people do have um, smartphones, cell phones, um, but still um, having difficulty with the uh, sustainable Wi-Fi um, and minutes and, and other things that, um, that have uh, provided some bar barriers. Um, even though I think the, 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 tele the technology has uh, proven to be 
uh, an interesting opportunity for uh, dismantling some obstacles that we need to look at very critically in our next steps. Um, there's been disproportionate educational disruption, um, and, and we've been very concerned about uh, children with special needs um, and whose parents also may already have um, language and educational barriers to be able to support their children in, in home uh, education. Um, and so uh, we're looking to see what really are going to be the outcomes of, of those children's uh, developmental trajectory and educational trajectory. Um, elevated trauma exposure, there is a concern about, you know, which, you know, I think we've all heard of uh, not having as many um, reports of any um, to child protection services um, and, and that there might be children who are, are being missed at this time who, who are in, in precarious situations. Um, and then obviously compounding existing trauma and disparities uh, when you are in a community that's seeing a disproportionate burden of, of illness and death um, and an economic hit from uh, a pandemic. Yep. So um, this is just, you know, when calling up parents, you know, there's different things that, uh, you know, they've they've told us uh, when we're checking in about how they're doing with um, the, tel the technology, the, the remote living um, in, in all the circumstances. And these are just some quotes, and I'll just read one of them. At least, you know, one mother says, Gracias a Dios, so thanks be to God, which is something that we hear um, tremendously around the importance of spirituality and, and sustaining through this. Um, Gracias a Dios, Dios todavía estamos aquí, we're still here. Hemos tenido muchas pérdidas, ha sido fuerte. We've had many losses. Um, it, it, sort of almost a euphemism every time, you know, I'm talking to people, we've lost so much, but we're still here, you know, but it's been, it's been hard. Um, you know, and in other comments, like the head de trabajar, I left work because I was worried about um, uh, infecting my family um, because I did not have protections at my job um, and then coming home and, you know, infecting people at home. And I could not uh, leave my child at home alone um, and I didn't have uh, child care. So all, all of the things that, um, that we know that people were, were, were are still continuing to struggle with. Next. Um, in terms of the, the telehealth, you know, I think it's been a challenge and an opportunity, as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, there has been some uh, situations of limited video technology access, and we actually, you know, in our outreach to families, uh, used a lot of audio, you know, tele, um, which, uh, you know, it, it's going to be interesting if we can still promote that as an, as an option um, for being able to at least uh, make connections and link people to care. Um, what we have found also is there's a need for infrastructure guidance and supports for community-based organizations to build their capacity. Um, we were actually better off as an academic center and we were still starting from zero to, you know, to San Francisco General and UCSF, we were still starting from zero to 100 um, uh, in terms of being able to provide tele, like quality telehealth services and at least being able to connect with patients and enroll them, especially new, new patients who are uh, experiencing increased need given the circumstances um, and being able to, to intake them and also uh, a deep need to be able to do cross system data sharing um, so that we could um, help our community based organizations um, outreach to where people were um, and also provide um, and the deep need for care navigation people to help link people to these new um, services that in many instances seem to have disappeared. Um, and people did not know where to reach out to. Next. So there is an opportunity there, right, for building capacity around community academic telehealth partnerships, which is what we're trying to institute now um, in terms of building capacity around using telehealth um, and uh, evidence-based treatments through those uh, mechanisms um, and outreach um, and really creating a learning systems hub, which we can, I think, all think about in our different regions um, can we create a multi-sector um, system, including organizations that outreach to Latino populations um, in, in creating hubs where we can um, sort of push the evidence base and, and, and quality of what we are able to do through uh, teletechnology uh, networks. Uh, next. And the other thing that we had to do is recognize the strengths of communities. Um, you know, and hearing, you know, my colleagues thinking, uh, speaking about the native populations, um, that, that is there too, in, in, a, in a very multicultural, um, multi-ethnic context um, in the Latinx community. Um, and what we have found is that, you know, in partnership with community-based organizations, what we need to do is cultivate resources with communities um, to offer accurate, sensitive information um, on the outbreak, uh, so information resource, 
but also for healing and providing care that is culturally uh, appropriate uh, with humility um, and that actually uh, works with the strengths of those communities. Um, when, I, when, I, when we outreach to um, some of the community-based organizations that, that are doing this, uh, you know, we started a Facebook in Vivo, a Facebook Live, um, to be able to, to have a dialogue with the community. Um, and we had this pregunta de doctor uh, sobre la salud mental, ask your doc asking the doctor about mental health. And we held these um, in Spanish um, and, uh, and bilingual in some instances. Um, and one of the messages that the community wants to get is la cultura cura, culture heals. Um, and they really wanted to hear uh, the bridging of our understanding of mental health um, uh, care but how did it match up and how can we integrate community-based understandings of well-being and healing and community? And how do we bring those together in this time? Next. So I think, you know, we need to optimize on the opportunities um, as child psychiatrists, as child providers, as people who work with families and communities. Um, we need to encourage um, CAP practices and local chapters to try to implement some of these and test out some of these best practices designed to address disparities. We have a lot of literature uh, out there about what are things that can actually have an impact on disparities. Um, uh, what are the disparities? Tons of research. Um, what might be some ways to overcome them? I think what we have to do is engage advocacy for promoting the policies and regulations, both uh, reimbursement, um, what are sort of the uh, emphasis on research? Uh, what, what is the emphasis on um, how we structure uh, systemically our, our services in collaboration with the community so that we can actually get to um, implementing what we know um, would be able to provide uh, uh, a decrease in the obstacles and barriers to care. Um, and then also build capacity for providing care to underserved communities in terms of workforce development. But um, the thing that I'm really understanding is that we have to do that in combination with not only our, 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 our organization, but also with our communities. Next. Um, and then I think also another place, uh, an opportunity in community partnerships, and this is really multicultural, multi-ethnic, is creating trauma-informed environments and relationships. Um, and Joyce Dorado, at, um, for example, at, at UCSF, has a UCSF Hearts, where we're really sort of, you know, she's really working with schools and other organizations around how to create equitable organizations, healing environments that are culturally um, informed and trauma informed. Next. So we really have to look at, you know, again, as I mentioned, regulations, reimbursement strategies, collaborative care uh, together to create these uh, strategies, uh, including technological advances. Next. And we need to unify with leadership, um, with other leaders, uh, other organizations, to really look at how can we do mental health prevention, interge interge intergenerational care, focus on racism as health disparities, um, really push for innovative policies for these cross-sector partnerships. Um, and, and as individual CAPs, uh, be involved in advocacy as well with um, ACAP Ad Advocacy Committee, which is there for us to be able to be unified. And then last slide. Next. Um, so we need to dismantle the structural barriers, I think is really the, the message um, I want to bring. Um, you know, the, the coronavirus may be agnostic, it, it hits everyone, even though there are disparities. Uh, we need to be able to respond right now um, in, in eliminating health disparities, otherwise the status quo will outlive this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cortuna. Uh, and the emphasis on our elders that are lost and the culture that is throughout this presentation. So I thank you so much. Next, we're going to have a presentation by Dr. Lisa Collins uh, from the, the Black Caucus. Thank you, Lisa. Dr. Collins. OK, wonderful. I'm unmuted. Good afternoon. We are almost there. I thank all of my colleagues who have come before me and their wonderful insights. Um, so I appreciate you. And I thank all of the attendees that have hung in there until, until now. So thank you for your patience and your listening. Um, so what's racism got to do with it? COVID-19 and beyond. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about racism. 
um, because it's extremely important. Then the amplification of racial inequities and injustices amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And then move into how do we foster hope amidst 400 years of historical trauma? What can we do at a provider, community, and national level? Next slide. So I think the most important thing when we embark upon this journey together, um, and I wanna emphasize this, when we embark upon this journey together, we need to embrace truths and we need to speak truths. So as healthcare providers, we must embrace and speak truths if we are to do no harm. What we signed our Hippocratic Oath to on our path to heal our patients, this is extremely important. One thing that we have to learn and understand and be open to and listen to um, are the shared and lived experiences of Black peoples. So when I say these names, George Floyd, that's shopping while Black. Ahmaud Arbery, that's jogging while Black. Breonna Taylor, that's sleeping while Black. And so many countless others who may remain nameless to you and invisible to you. But this is once again, the shared and lived experience of people from the African diaspora. So I think it's really important. I appreciate the definitions that, have, that were provided at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and I wanted to review one and that's for racism. And I think it's really important, the one that I'm gonna share with you, when we think about racism, and when we think about racism in particular in the African American community, I think it's very important that we embrace these words. So it's the perpetuation of the lie that black people, people of African ancestry, are inferior and less than. It was the dehumanization of black peoples and the implicit and explicit lie that white people are superior. So our opportunities are less than, our salaries are less than, our housing is less than, our green spaces are less than, our health care is less than. So once again, I think it's very important that we are clear about what this means in the Black community. The other thing as healthcare providers, um, we are very intelligent people, and so we have lots of fancy names and words and terminology. So once again, we need to embrace the truth. Racism begets social determinants of health, begets adverse childhood events, begets persistent pervasive health disparities and inequities. We cannot use the terminology in our presentations, in our forums, um, in our academic institutions, in our outpatient clinics, when we say social determinants of health, please also mention racism. When you say ACEs, please don't forget the word racism. When we talk about health disparities and equities, racism is at the core. So I hope you all um, were able to tune in for Dr. Carlson's wonderful screenside chats. And one, um, which I truly appreciate it, was from our current AMA president, Dr. Patrice Harris, who is the first African-American female child psychiatrist president of AMA. Very proud of her. And so one thing that resounded to me are some of her definitions that she provided. So disparities, differences in health outcomes between groups. But when we look, about, look at health inequities, this is differences in the population regarding health outcomes that are systemic, avoidable, patterned, unjust, and actionable. And so these words truly resonated with me. Next slide, please. So we have two pandemics. We've all been talking about it. I won't dwell too much on it. Um, so we have racism that has came long before COVID-19 and here we are with COVID-19. Um, when we look at the numbers, so the death rate 
six times higher in predominantly non-white areas as compared to predominantly white. Where I live in DC, black residents represent less than 50% of the population, but comprise nearly 80% of the deaths. In Chicago, where I grew up on the south side of Chicago, black residents represent 30% of the population, but comprise over 50% of the deaths. And when we look at the national data, African Americans have fallen victim to COVID deaths more than any other racial group. When we look at 100,000 people, Blacks rank highest with 42.8, Latinx 19.1, Asians 18.4, and Whites 16.6. Next slide, please. So when we have two pandemics at play, racism and a highly spreadable virus, the risks and the devastating impact are extraordinary. So our directions were stay at home, physical distance, only seek care if symptoms are severe. And so when we looked at the risks, African-Americans were low likely to have low incomes, live in densely crowded multi-generational homes, disproportionately constitute essential workforce, service jobs, there is no option of sick leave or teleworking, increased prevalence of underlying health conditions, under-resourced safety net hospitals and our communities and our neighborhoods, or access and quality of care, and decreased utilization and delay, delayed access, and more likely to be uninsured or underinsured. So this one-size-fits-all approach guidance for this one pandemic, COVID-19, was ineffective, impractical, unattainable, and disproportionately in communities of color because of the other pandemic, racism. Next slide. So with these two pandemics at play, the, dev the devastating impact is huge. When we talk about food insecurities, housing insecurities, financial insecurities, all these things across all levels amplified. Educational inequities, once again, my colleagues have spoken to this already. We also have black youth who are disproportionately in the foster care system. So now these children um, who have already been displaced from their families of origin, they're spending now extended time in the foster care system. Court dates aren't happening and they're further fragmented from their families. Um, one thing that is a protective factor is really the strength of our community and our community connectedness. And so religion and spirituality and the faith-based organizations play an important role. Um, and so with this pandemic, there's been limited access to these places of worship, um, which has also been a contributing factor. And then when we talk about mental health and well-being, con chronic toxic stress, it's fully amplified as well. Next slide. So fostering hope amidst 400 years of historical trauma. I really want that sentence to sit and resonate with people because it's just not a throwaway sentence. This is 400 years of historical trauma. How do we foster hope with that? So I think the most important thing is to take time to think pause, turn within, self-reflect, do some introspection, and then ask yourself a question, how am I contributing and combating racism as a provider at an organizational level and an institutional level? And so this is the personal level because we cannot function in these arenas as a provider within our organizations and our institutions if we have not been able to come to peace and embrace our truths at a personal level. At a provider level, we are healers. How can you heal your patient if you cannot see them? If you don't understand your patients and you're not allowing yourself to learn from your patients. We are trained listeners as psychiatrists. Use this skill set. Disarm yourself and be open to listening to your patient's stories and their lived experiences. Patient-centered, culturally informed care. We hear that a lot. It's extremely important. 
it goes far beyond but from having the child and the family at a treatment team meeting and signing the treatment team paper. Their voice is important. This is part of the patient-centered care. Advocate for your patients. Amplify their voices in your voice and your action. And do this all the time for all of your patients. We are all unique and different and we have our unique and different life experiences. So we as providers have to avoid these assumptions. And once again, every patient encounter is just a new experience and it's an opportunity for you to learn. Next slide, please. So fostering hope at a community level. So collaborative care, we hear about that all the time. We probably have some of those programming um, and we might be a collaborative care clinician. This would be collaborative care at its best. How do we really collaborate with the community and engage in the community when we talk about schools, community stakeholders, faith-based organizations, extracurricular and after-school activities? So when we're talking about the arts, athletics, nonprofit organizations, and also seeking funding opportunities. At the national level, so when we kind of flip back to COVID-19, we need to prioritize testing and care to vulnerable communities with the highest disease burden. So resources, testing centers, they all need to go to those safety net hospitals. They're, they're so under-resourced. Teaching hospitals need to collect the sociodemographic information and data to better understand COVID-19 and health, uh, health outcomes as well. Next slide. And at the national level, all my colleagues have mentioned this. We have to join forces and in our intellectual brain trust and resources with our partners, APA, American Academy of Pediatrics, AMA, the, the um, Association of American Medical Colleges, Black Psychiatrists of America, um, our, resource, our research institutions, the National Institute of Health, SAMHSA, HRSA. It's so important that we integrate all of these levels and partners. We also engage business stakeholders and funders. And I know our own ACAP Advocacy and Government Affairs Office, um, we can continue to engage them and support them in the work that they do. Our workforce, my colleagues have mentioned this as well, underrepresented minorities, faculty positions and leaders, where are they? There's about three, they, re they represent 3%. And that is unacceptable. We have to look at medical student training. And really, as we are clinician educators, most of us are, what are we modeling for our future, for our future thought leaders? And once again, that goes back to taking a time to reflect and turn within and embracing our truths. Um, many organizations already have implicit bias training, but this is going to be an opportunity where you take a few steps back and say, well, has it really been effective? So how do you revamp that? And then most importantly, looking at sustainable, comprehensive efforts to improve access, quality of care at the legislative level, when we're looking at reimbursement, loan repayment, mental health care as primary care, and that's for even child psychiatry. Next slide. So conclusions, and this is really important um, on a personal level um, and then beyond. So as the disturbing images and media coverage dissipate, it is not enough to denounce and condemn racism. As I've done my online shopping, I appreciate all of the stores that have condemned and denounced racism. But now you have to do something about that. It's not enough. So you, organizations, institutions, you have to do something to affect that positive change. So as I said before, this is an opportunity for all of us to pause, reflect, and ask ourselves how we can do better to eradicate racial inequities, which are lethal in communities of color and African-American communities in particular. So I charge you to stand up and show up. Speak up. Stand by something and pursue it and make sure it's sustainable. When I say show up, be present, be present, disarm yourself so you can listen to these stories 
It's so important. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Collins, for that presentation from the Black Caucus. Very appreciative. I, I'm thanking all the panelists for all of your dynamic, wonderful presentations today. We've had a lot of questions online, a lot of questions in the chat and the questions there. Some have been answered, and there are a number of ones to, um, to reflect upon that are going to come up. Uh, Dr. Amutin and Dr. Uh, Carabagos is going to join us shortly. The first question that we're going to send out to is for Dr. Annie Lee and uh, Dr. Jen Cho of the Asian Caucus uh, regarding what AAPI is for and uh, addressing the shortages in the AAPI community uh, providers. You want to go first? <laughs> sure. So. The full, the, I mean, I think we we were so in a rush to try to condense all the information. We didn't do a do good job at um, sharing what the acronyms were. So AAPI stands for Asian American Pacific Islanders. And I think one of the um, uh, a question in the audience that came through was um, there's a strong reputation representation, I think, um, you know, in, in the larger sense of practicing Asian American psychiatrists and perhaps even in the, um, you know, psychiatrists at large. And then when it comes to um, positions of leadership, um, and particularly in academia and faculty, there seems to be an absence of Asian Americans. And we do acknowledge that. Um, you know, when we first started, Asian Caucus is a very young caucus in the ACAP history. It just started actually in 2017. Um, actually 2018, I was I want to correct myself. Um, and, and we did some informal polling. So what we saw was like this bimodal curve where there was a lot maybe of the older retiring generation of Asian American psychiatrists who are potentially leaving the workforce. And then on the other end, tail end of it is a rise of medical students, residents, general psychiatry residents and Asian American child psychiatry fellows and early career psychiatrists who are coming in and joining in. And then there's this void of mid-career psychiatrists, which I identify myself with, um, who are in the prime position to start thinking about, you know, going to these little leadership positions, but there's just not that much of us. And I want to also address that there are, um, you know, uh, structural um, inequities, discrimination and racism that is uh, that, it, that needs to be acknowledged. Um, in, in institutions, um, in academia, um, that, that needs to promote, I think collectively with all the speakers are saying, to, to um, you know, increase our presence in those roles so that we can kind of um, you know, address these changes. And I think when Dr. Cho and I looked at the data from AAMC in 2018, um, I think the American, the US uh, psychiatry workforce is predominantly 20% minority and 80% um, white. So I think the distribution also contributes to that as well. I just want to add to what um, Annie was talking about. I think in our Asian caucus, we're trying really hard to uh, foster the younger generation because there is lack of uh, leadership and lack of um, role models that we could uh, look up to. There are some, but they're not too many. Um, and um, there's multiple layers of why that is, including uh, stigma within our community as well against uh, psychiatry. But there's definitely much more interest in the younger generation and more interest in contributing to mental health of our community. And I think that's something that we are trying really hard to foster within our caucus. Thank you both so much for those those answers. Uh, Dr. Carabajo, um, what's happened many times that people are asking, how can people join the various caucuses? Um, and we'd love for you to answer that question for us. Uh, yes, hi everyone. Um, so we will, can you see me? Um, we have, um, first of all, I wanna thank our two wonderful leaders of the, um, Diversity and Culture Committee, Dr. Lisa Collins and Dr. Cheryl Amatine, who are just amazing. Um, and so under their leadership, we have um, four different caucuses. Um, the Asian Caucus that is um, chair, chaired by Dr. Anna Lee and Dr. Um, Ji Cho. Um, we have the um, Latinx Caucus, which is chaired by um, Dr. Lisa Fortuna and myself, Dr. Angel Caraballo. And we have the IMG Caucus, which is chaired by um, Dr. Balcazar Adams and um, Dr. Mandolin Das. 
And also we have the Black Caucus, which is chaired by Dr. Ken Rogers and Dr. Cheryl Almatin. And also we want to say that um, the two other committees that participated today are the Rural Committee, which is chaired by Dr. Tom Hoffman, and the Native American Committee, which is chaired by Dr. Susan Daly and Dr. Richard Livingston. And the committees, um, just to know, any of these caucuses or committees, you can participate even if you're not um, appointed to be in any of these committees. So um, the more the merrier, so we welcome everyone. I would add to that that you can um, send an email to training at acap.com. Let them know that you would like to be added to a caucus and you will be added to the list serve for that particular caucus. In addition, as um, was just stated, if you reach out to the committee chairs for the committees that you're interested in, you'll probably be able to participate. Any, any member of ACAP can attend committee meetings um, during the annual meeting. And so then you can get to know them and participate in activities. Uh, thank you, Dr. Carabao, Dr. Uh, Almatin. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Livingston of the Rural Committee. Uh, is, sub is suicide and substance abuse really high in rural areas? And is the risk for COVID-19 uh, any higher there? Dr. Livingston? As I say, from a rural perspective, I think that you know, rural areas are strapped. In Montana, for example, the Crow Reservation has been hit hard by the virus, um, more so than we've seen other areas with similar populations. Um, rural areas often have less access to care um, in Montana, especially on reservations. So I think the COVID, from my perspective, the COVID-19 pandemics really exacerbated some of the already existing disparities and lack of access that have been present. All of the, res all of the reservations are, uh, are potentially uh, hot spots for suicide attempts and suicide completions and it uh, it varies wildly according to situations but all stressors um, and especially being cut off from support seem to be closely associated with that so individuals who are cut off from their support systems uh, who are on a reservation uh, are particularly vulnerable. So I would, you know, try to be aware of that kind of situation as something to uh, notify you that, that you need to be ready to step in. Uh, uh, thank you both, uh, Dr. Hoffman and Dr. Livingston, uh, about that. Uh, is there a, qu there's also a question about racial ethnic groups in, in rural areas that I think both of you can also address. Uh, is there any information uh, regarding or where should people look for information to help with uh, guiding some of their decision making and how they work with the different populations in these areas? Do you want to start first, Dr. Uh, Dr. Livingston, you're muted. Okay, I'm sorry. I I'm not good with this, I'm a Luddite. Uh, the best information about any given tribe is from the tribe. And the best way to relate to the tribe is with the tribe. You know, if you wanna know uh, what's going on there, that's who you talk to and that's who you relate to. Uh, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. It, you know, even for other groups as well, outside of Native Americans. Um, I'm not aware of any specific studies off the top of my head that specifically address some of those issues of geographical differences or um, racial differences in rural versus urban areas. But I do think that when you combine some of the um, lack of access issues, some of the rural issues that arise, then you combine them with other inequities that creates a synergistic effect that makes it harder to access care or to receive care. Again, thank you both. Uh, the, the next question is for uh, Dr. Lisa Fortuna um, for the Hispanic Caucus. Uh, regarding the roles of implicit and bias in, in different populations, uh, do you have any words of wisdom in terms of discussing that, talking about it, and helping clinicians and patients with it? In terms of implicit bias for um, in, our, in our care, 
I'm imagining. Yes. Um, so yeah, um, you know, there. It, it's very interesting. I mean, in the Latin, Latino population, you know, obviously, like the Black and, and other communities, um, implicit bias is is an issue that really um, has an impact on care, um, and that's part of what we we're trying to do with these community um, organization supports and being able to at least build bridges um, because we know that um, you know in our both our black and latino populations um, even the best the best care that people try to provide there's always this um, this sense of you know what what people will be really uh, willing to do you know what what care should be provided to people um, there's a there's a large intersection right with the Latino population in terms of um, race, um, you know, both, you know, black and indigenous populations that we have even within the Latino population that I think also feeds into implicit bias about people's um, dangerousness um, uh, and how it impacts on, you know, how people are restrained, um, approached by the police or security, even in our hospitals. Um, how providers um, make decisions around um, child safety and calling CPS and um, how to how they're you know even sort of offering particular types of care, thinking that people won't um, come through with that care um, because they're not having the conversations that are really around um, cultural understanding and and sort of uh, bridging what what might be able to be healing. So. I think all of those things come in that we have to consider, um, and there's a lot of implicit bias training, um, like Lisa was talking about, Dr. Collins, um, that really needs to take a, a, a multiracial, multiethnic perspective. Thank you. I can stay there, please. Um, along those lines, uh, along, to be successful in recruitment and retention of underrepresented uh, racial minorities in medical universities, are there any actionable items for the panel uh, to? that you recommend, this question also goes to uh, Lisa Collins, Dr. Lisa Collins, and for Dr. Cho, Dr. Lee, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I think we have to make, and I, and I welcome the other people's comments, but I think we have to make an investment in um, resource right? um, from a very early stage in terms of even recruiting. I mean, we're, we're talking a lot about pipeline right, in terms of workforce, um, go, going down as far as, you know, high school, to be honest, and college, and then medical school, um, you know, into child psychiatry, getting people very early to understand, you know, what is what is our field, and um, and not just medicine, other, other um, healthcare providers and, and mental health providers, um, to understand, you know, really what our, our field is, um, but to support people. <laughs> being able to do that. I mean, one of the things that we're having challenges in, in the hospital is that, you know, we're having a hard time recruiting people because it's, at least in San Francisco, it's hard to live in afford San Francisco. Um, and, um, and it's hard to do internships that are not paid um, for a lot of our, our, our folks and communities. So um, we have to sort of really put some investments and in resources so that people can can sustain themselves in, as through their training, but also expose them very early um, into our field. Um, but I'll let Lisa Collins add to that and others. Oh, you're muted. Aha. I'm still got my technical woes. Um, so, and just to add to that, I think, and kind of speaking to what I addressed in my talk when we when I say that everyone needs to really embrace some truths and to speak truths, I really charge folks that are currently in leadership positions to look around and see what have they done to mentor underrepresented minorities? What have they done to support and ignite their, their passions um, and their talents and elevate them? And I think that needs to be done right now. Once again, if 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 you, that person, is making a commitment to march forward to impact change, that they need to turn within and look um, as they have sat in a leadership position, who who have they brought up along with them? And if it hasn't been diverse, they need to question themselves and maybe change their practices as well. Um, because I know that there are, that we certainly we're underrepresented, but then we are there. 
but then there's huge disparities and discrepancies on how we are mentored, how we are supported, and how we are promoted. I, I just to add, uh, um, the mentorship is so important. I think I'm I'm a recipient of mentorship, um, but um, seeing representation, I think, in leadership is very important. Seeing that. Um, others have done something and they are in the leadership position or in faculty position so that you can have something to look forward to. Um, I think that's been very uh, important. And we talk about kind of a mentor, mentoring program for our caucus as well, because um, you know, Annie and I talk about, we don't really have those mentors uh, when we were in uh, medical school, college, um, even in residency. And so uh, having that representation is very important. Two words, mentorship, as everyone has echoed, and sponsorship, because it's one thing to mentor and it's another to create that position, create that space where, where that individual can flourish and do the work that they, they want to do. Oh, thank you all doctors for that. Really appreciative. Dr. Uh, Daly, uh, Dr. Susan Daly, um, there were some questions regarding um, uh, indigenous populations, cancellations of powwows and things of that nature, do you anticipate some increased mental health burdens and needs uh, on the horizon because of some of these things? Uh -oh. You're muted. You're muted, doctor. Is that better? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yay. All right. So powwows serve a lot of purposes. Thinking back to the fact that so many communities were decimated, powways came into being to provide communication, gathering, building of culture, building of spirit, and they are essential to a lot of communities also because they allow youth to interact with uh, other youth when they get together. They allow them to practice skills, traditional dancing. It's an opportunity to honor elders and other individuals who have given back to the community. It is also a financial opportunity for a lot of these individuals. The competitions have prize money. There are the drumming circles that get experience so that they can go out and continue various traditional uh, music. They have lots of different purposes. So yes, this is going to have a huge impact. It's going to have an impact on the elders. It's going to have an impact on the youth. It's going to have an impact on the community in general. So there have already been individuals that have talked to me about the fact that they're not going to see their friends. They only get to see at the powwows once a year, that type of thing. So it's very important that they have other opportunities. The internet is nice, but a lot of these places don't have good internet access as a rural committee uh, presentation showed. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, uh, along those lines, in terms of representation, do you think there are other things that clinicians need to be aware of in the indigenous population uh, that you think is often overlooked sometimes in our in our treatment of the of to them to our patients? With the indigenous population, having a connection to their provider is important. So many times the providers just rotate through and they don't get a close connection, and trust has to be built. There's been a lot of reason for mistrust amongst the indigenous community. And if they can develop trust, then they can talk with you more and be more open with you about what's stressing them, but also about any natural or indigenous uh, native treatments that they're going through. Uh, Dr. Livingston may be able to speak more specifically to that, but you need to be aware if they're using herbs or ceremony that involves certain types of body stressors, et cetera, and whether they're able to do what they usually do is going to be another stressor for them. Dr. Livingston? That's, yes, that's very important. And, and the other thing that makes that even more important is that once you develop that connection, you got to sustain it because there's really nothing that's harder on Indians than a broken connection. Um, a a fly-by-neck do-gooder is like the worst thing. And there have been too many o over, the, over the years and the decades. So uh, make the connection and then sustain it, sustain it, sustain it. Oh, thank you so much, both of you, for those comments. Uh, Dr. Adam Balcazar, can you join us, please? 
of right now in terms of the international medical graduates, uh, some other thoughts that you think are very useful for uh, us as clinicians to really consider as we're working uh, with some people as they're graduating and uncertain about their job prospects and everything that's going on now with COVID in terms of uh, things that we should really be aware of to continue to help them. I think the international graduates are under a lot of stress, as you know, and they are very much needed. You know, they bring a lot of culture, they bring a lot of uh, background that can be very helpful. And, you know, by the time they are here, they went through a lot. They, they just, it's not easy. They are survivor. And then when they have the opportunity to get a chance to work, they are very appreciative of the opportunity and, and they try to work hard. At the beginning, it might be very hard for them to catch up, but with their hard work and with mentorship, they are able to uh, reach the, the place that they needed to be and to be helpful for the patients. So uh, they need mentorship when they are uh, as a student, when they are resident, when, when they graduate, and they need somebody <clears throat> that can uh, be there for them and reflect and give them good guidance. Uh, with that in mind, they, were, they are able to reach what they can do and be there for their patient and support them. And sometimes even when the minority patient see international medical graduate, it reminds them that they are also minority like them, so they might feel more comfortable opening up for them. So continuous support with the, uh, the international medical graduate and trying to learn from each other and support each other is important. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for that. R reminding everyone here that we are all individual advocates for our patients, but we're also collectively advocates through our advocacy committee and our advocacy liaison. And the, the advocacy uh, committee has a meeting the first Monday of each month um, reminding people to be a part of that so they can see how ACAP is really bringing forth the initiatives that each of you so passionately spoke about today and are continuing to speak about. In this age of COVID, there's also that many of us have so much passion and we, we, we really want to be in academia and learning, but there's a, a concern about money and money is being a driving factor in academia. And be, because of that, that's a, often a, a problem in terms of recruitment in so many different uh, minority populations in terms of being able to work within them because of the because of uh, money. Uh, so ideas about that would be wonderful, or this should definitely be something that academic, academic institutions should be thinking about as they're trying to expand that pipeline and have more representation of everyone within the field to actually help with the delivery of care. Uh, so I thank you, Dr. Um, Balcazar, for your comments and all of the panelists. I would also like for Dr. Caraballo and Dr. Almatin to come back and join us, the co-chairs right now, uh, regarding some uh, closing comments and closing questions. And um, we may also have the panelists come back as well. Um, I would... I would really like to um, read the very last um, question that came to us. Uh, it says, does practicing cultural safety emphasize and emphasizing empowerment and self-determination mitigate against stereotype bias, uh, against stereotype threat and implicit bias? I understand that individuation um, can all present in the clinical encounter. Self-reported cultural competency is a poor predictor of an individual's level of implicit bias with a citation. Um, and healthcare practitioners are urged to move beyond the notion of cultural competence and to acknowledge that issues of race, power, and privilege in the hierarchical relationship that predisposes to stereotyping and creates unconscious bias are all present. I think that that's a very good statement, and I think that it's important for all of us um, to simply recognize where we are, begin to question where we actually are, and talk to those that we work with about how we're coming across. We can also look for opportunities to learn more about this for ourselves. We can attend 
workshops at ACAP and at other kinds of presentations to help us to help us develop in this area. I think one of the things that we're all appreciating as part of the syndemic is that there's so much that we don't know, so much that we want to learn to be able to understand about um, social determinants of health and the impact of all of this on the children and youth that we work with. Anything else that you would add on how? Yeah, um, well, so I want to actually thank everyone from ACAP. Um, first, I want to thank Dr. Gabrielle Carlson for um, supporting this effort and our executive director, um, Heidi Ford, and everybody else who helped um, put this together. There are tons of people who helped us put it together at ACAP. So I want to thank all the amazing staff. Um, and then also want to answer, there were a couple of questions about CME. Um, this event, unfortunately, does, does not meet CME requirements. Um, and there was also a question about should ACAP um, have an annual CME um, event about race, racism and health dis healthcare disparities. Um, please know that we will um, be working as part of the DNC committee with um, the leadership at ACAP to um, attempt and make that happen. Once again, we you know we want to ex uh, express our gratitude to Dr. Carlson and Heidi Ford for truly for, um, being behind us in this effort. So thank you. I, I want to thank all of the panelists, uh, if they can join for a very robust uh, presentation, dynamic presentation, informative presentation, enlightening, and a very, very challenging time that reminds us of all the, how interconnected we really all are, that with the resources that we have, that we as individuals can really do a lot with our for our patients and collectively we can do wonderful things for our patients, but also reminding us all to very, really much take care of ourselves as we're taking care of our patients uh, during this COVID crisis, during all of the things that have arisen during this time, uh, for everyone working against structural uh, racism and all of the barriers that prevent us from having equality in healthcare for all. I thank you all. I thank the co-chairs, thank our executive director and our president again, uh, you've been a wonderful audience. Thanks for support. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you, the Diversity Care uh, Diversity Committee um, uh, support staff for everything that you're doing, and for organization and Alex and all of the technical work that's done to support this presentation. Uh, thank you. And I hope I didn't miss anybody.